Thank you. Well, first and foremost, you know, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's kind of strange because when you reflect sometimes on your career and you wonder, you know, how did that kid turn into the bio that gets read out? And the truth is, I shouldn't be here. And I don't mean kind of literally here now because this is, this is a real pleasure, but if I reflect back on my journey, there's no way I should be here now. And so I thought I'd tell you my story, but I'd split it into four pieces of advice. So the first piece is don't ever define yourself by your job. The second piece will be talking about why resilience, in my opinion, is the single most important life skill you'll ever have. The third piece is about curiosity, and the fourth story is around failure. So, don't define yourself by your job. So when I grew up, I grew up right next to an international airport. So as a child, my days and nights were watching planes go by. And so for me, there was only one career path, airline pilot. So, you know, as a kid, I was building at little airband radios with components so I could listen to what the pilots were talking about. I managed to string an antenna across the garden so I could listen to some of the transatlantic flights. And when I was about 10 or 11, I remember getting a taste for this. We went to an air show and my dad bought me one of those little experiences in those you know, tiny little planes with the propellers on the nose. And I was hooked. I was like, this is it. I don't want to do anything else. But then, you know, you get older and reality kicks in and being an airline pilot is a really, really expensive career choice. And it wasn't one which we could afford as a family. So I thought, if I want to do this, I've got to find a different way. I'm not going to qualify for a scholarship in that world because I wasn't kind of clever enough for that. And I hadn't joined, you know, the air cadets early enough. So then I had an idea. So one day, I went into my dad's office, and he was, a, he was selling kind of kitchen linen door to door pretty much, and he'd bought a computer. And I'd always been kind of interested in drawing and making creative things, and so I started, you know, mucking about and realized, actually, you know, this, this could be fun. And I had a plan, and my plan was, I'm gonna pick up the yellow pages, and I'm gonna phone businesses, and I'm gonna say, I'll design something for you for 50 pounds which is a lot of money to a 13-year-old, right? And my plan was really simple. Every two jobs I do will pay for one flying lesson. That was the plan. So then so I started. Yellow pages, phoning businesses, phoning businesses, and bizarrely, some of them gave me a chance. And so this little side gig grew. But it grew in a way I never really expected, okay? So now picture the scene. I'm now 16 years old. I now had staff in New York, London, Sydney, and Manchester. I was running a business from my backpack at school, and it became really apparent that maybe there was another career path for me outside being a pilot, but I had legitimized it in a pilot's license, which at least made being a plane spotter um, slightly cooler. But it was a bit of a rock and roll time. This was the first dot-com bubble. You know, this was a real rock and roll time to be in technology. We were flying around the world to conferences. We were, you know, getting VIP passes for all sorts of things. We'd been launching pioneering technology, some of which are still in use today. And it was just incredible. I can't even tell you how incredible it was, but I only realized that in retrospect, because at the time, it's your job. You don't really see that. And it's funny because you always hear this myth about the college dropout who goes and does well, but I had really strict Indian parents. And so being a dropout was not an option. So I did go to university. I came to Manchester. I did management and marketing um, with textiles. The reason being, it was the fewest taught hours of any degree course I could find and enabled me to run my business. Um, so things were growing, going really, really well until all of a sudden they didn't. So a massive company called WorldCom suddenly went bust. Some of you might remember WorldCom. It was fundamentally like Google is now. And imagine literally waking up one morning and the headline in the newspaper was Google's gone bust. And believe it or not, at the time, people still considered the internet to be a bit of a fad. So all of a sudden, our clients were phoning us up going, oh yeah, we're not, we're not gonna really pursue this internet thing anymore. And you might be able to survive if one or two clients pull their business, but most of them did. And so I basically had to make a very tough decision to shut down the parts of the business I could to pay for the parts of the business I couldn't. And there I was, kind of back to square one. And this is where the life lesson came in. Don't define yourself by your job. 
I'd always been Vikas, the CEO of this. I'd always been Vikas, that young business guy. Who am I now? Who am I when everything is taken away? And it takes you to a really low point, and you still do this every day. If you go to a party and there's new people there, if you say to someone, if I walk up to someone and go, so tell me about yourself, there's very few people who start that conversation without saying what they do. And think about it, how sad is that? That that is what defines us. And actually, if we wanna build great careers for ourselves, we need to find out who we are when what we do isn't there, because that's when we're gonna really, really make progress. And I had to learn that the extraordinarily hard way, but it's something I really wish had been taught to me earlier. The second story is around resilience. And you know, we kind of hear about success stories, and a lot of them have a founding myth. And the founding myth is like, you know, the guy on Dragon's Den goes, well, I was brought up in a bucket at the side of the road or whatever, and now I'm a billionaire, and, and that's fine. But then you typically see founding myth followed by success story. And the success story always seems quite resolved, and it always seems like quite a clear trajectory. But it's not true. That's not how life is. You know, people write my bio for events, and I might read something about me, and it looks like I've had this phenomenal journey, but you know what? There's definitely been fun bits, but the journey that I've talked about had four suicide attempts, one of which got extraordinarily close. It had probably 15 to 20 years of anxiety and depression, therapists, doctors, lost sleep, the works, and that's the bit that you don't really hear about. That's the bit that people don't really talk about. And that's kind of really sad because it makes people forget how important resilience is. Because I know that that's why I ended up in that situation because resilience isn't really drilled into us early on. You know, for example, so I teach on MBA programs now. And if I could, I'd take the whole syllabus, shred it and turn it into a resilience degree. Because actually that's the most important thing that's going to make you successful. Because that's what gives you the coping skills to cope with the reality of when things don't go well. And you know what? It doesn't matter what you think you are or who you think you are, everyone can build resilience into their lives. It could be mindfulness, it could be exercise, it could be filling your life with interesting things that matter outside what you do. But you need to practice it, and you need to put it into your lives as early as you can, because the world now is so much more competitive than it ever was before. You might think you're working on groundbreaking research, but guess what? Somebody a few thousand miles away might be one-upping you as we speak right now. And that's the truth. And so resilience is more important than ever. But that also means we need to talk about how we feel. There's a culture around being silent. We have to be at peak performance all the time. We have to be hustling. We have to be always available. We have to be answering emails in the middle of the night. But it's not true. That's a cult. It's the cult of being on the hustle. It's not how you make a successful life. You have to look after yourself first and foremost. Protect your mental health. And make sure that you talk about things when they're not going right. Because that helps you and it might help other people too. I remember two years ago delivering a TEDx um, in Manchester. One of the scariest things I've ever done, two and a half thousand people talking about um, a suicide attempt in, in pretty graphic detail. And it was, it was crap, it was horrible. It was an awful experience doing that. But do you know what? I finished that event, I came off stage, and somebody just stopped me talking outside and said, I've been feeling like I wanted to and I don't want to now. So you talking can save someone's life. And especially when you're doing things which are new, things which are necessarily going to be stressful, you need to keep talking. And don't listen to the myths. Don't listen to the myths that medication doesn't work. Don't listen to the myths that therapy doesn't work. They do. And if you are going through something, Manchester's one of the best universities to get the help you need. The third story is being curious. And this is a funny one, because we're kind of trained to only do the thing that we're taught to do. We're trained that, I am an engineer, so maybe I should just, just focus on engineering. But my life didn't really work like that. You can have to follow the threads sometimes as they come to you. I'll give you an example. I got asked once to um, be on the board of a film festival. And I thought, well, you know, it could be fun. Don't know anything about films, but, you know, we'll see. 
And the director of the film festival was a guy called Simon Powell. And we were chatting over a coffee and he said, and I was saying, you know, I've never read a film script, send me one. I've got a couple of flights, I'm flying on Iberia, which is one of the worst airlines in the universe. Some of you obviously know. Almost as bad as Air India, which is the worst airline in the universe. And so I read this film script and I started reading it over coffee and I was like, this is incredible. And I said to Simon, let's make a film. How hard can it be, right? It's, it's really, really hard. Um, but it was also one of the most soul-affirming experiences of my entire life. And I basically had to fund this film to make it. And then we ended up winning some awards and it was great. And that spurred film business, which is incredible. Or just starting a blog because I was curious about asking people questions and learning about people's lives. And that blog suddenly turns into this other machine, becomes thought economics, and then I end up speaking at international conferences about my blog. These are just threads you follow out of curiosity. Most of them will lead you nowhere. Most of the threads you follow will just unravel and leave you. But some of them will make really interesting things in your life. And if you're not curious, you're not going to make amazing things happen. Because even in science, in discovery, from all the interviews I've done, from all the people I've spoken to, the thing that makes those big discoveries is serendipity, which comes from outside your field. So you have to stay curious because that's where the magic happens. And the final one is about failure. And I thought it was particularly relevant today because every single one of you in this room is doing something new. You're all doing things well outside the realms of what is done, what can be done, what should be done, what may be done. And so, do you know what? There is a fairly high chance of failure, and that's fine. But even in business, in science, in all of these fields, we kind of don't say that. We don't say that it's fine. We don't really call failure a learning experience. We still brush it under the carpet sometimes. But we can't. I've had more business failures than I've had successes. It's just that some of the successes have worked out fine. In fact, when I'm investing in a business, I'm really frightened of an entrepreneur that hasn't had some successes and had some failures along the way too. Because if you've not failed, you've not learned anything in life. You've not learned how to come back. You've not learned how to adapt. You've not learned what it means to make a bad decision and deal with those consequences. And that's resilience again. One of the people I interviewed, one of my favorite ever interviews, was with a guy called Ed Catmull. So Ed Catmull founded Pixar, co-founded Pixar, sorry. And um, I did this really fun interview with him talking about animation and storytelling and all this. And... The last question I asked him, he, his, his response really floored me. And I said, so Ed, if I can call you Ed now, um, what's the single most important piece of advice you'd give me? And if you permit me to read the quote, Ed said, most people still interpret failure as an unfortunate thing, but that's not what it means. Failure means that you're trying to live life. And the fact that you fail means that you're trying. The minute you try to avoid failure, it means your life's facing in the wrong direction. Thank you.